For example, if you spend $100 and you get a $10 reward, you just made $10. That's, 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 that's not accurate. That's, that's not how that works. Yeah, okay. because now in a future purchase, you just saved yourself $10. If you return an item at the store, you just earn money. So if you return something and buy something at the same time, it was free. No, 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 because you, you had to spend the money the first time. No, but then the second time it's free because it's no extra money. Or like if you pay for cash with something, it's free because it's not coming out of your bank account. Um, I, I just, I, I feel like or this just, one's so good like if you go to starbucks or duncan and you use your app you scan and pay it's free I'm never because that have, money was already there i'm never gonna have money never. what do you mean uh, it's, 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 this is this is your mindset oh anybody relate to that one huh i love I love that understanding of, of money, right? Hey, you know, if we return it, then it's basically free because we already spent the money, so it's free anyways. It doesn't cost anything. <laughs> life can be a journey. It's full of twists, turns, and if we're really honest, life's full of like financial roller coasters. It's crazy how much things happen in life. Money, it's like that ever-present companion, right? It's always around. Everybody has a need for it. Everybody has, uh, a, 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 it, they've got it at some level, and at times everybody stresses out about it. This series, Keep the Change, and today we're not just talking about dollars and cents, we're talking about the intersection of faith and finances. And so today we're looking at, at God's perspective on money, and how God's perspective on money, it's like an ultimate guidebook. And so here's the thing. When we, we talk today, we're going to talk about culture and the lies that culture tells us. And if we look at culture, and if we do what culture says with our money, don't be surprised when you get culture results. If you do what culture tells you to do with your money, don't be surprised when you get culture results. But if you do what the Redeemer says, don't be surprised when you get Redeemer results. We're talking about unmasking money lies. That's the title of the message today, unmasking money lies. I want to talk with you today about three lies that culture tells us about money, and then we're going to look at what Jesus says about those lies as well. And so in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus, he says this. He says, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And when I think about money in our world today, it's a dark topic. It's a challenging thing for a lot of people because sadly, it, money is a place of bondage for a lot of people. It's a place of guilt. It's a place of shame. It's a place of embarrassment because of the mistakes that have been made. But when we begin to, to filter everything through this lens of scripture that Jesus is talking about, it changes, and there's actually light that comes. That's what money, money is a tool. Money is a tool to be used for God's kingdom. And so the first lie, and we're going to spend a portion of our time here today, but the first lie that culture tells us is that you deserve what they have. Culture tells you you deserve what they have. When you buy blank, then you're going to be happy. Right? You just, if you just got a newer car, then you're going to be happy. I mean, a new car, that's going to make, I'm going to be good. Things will be set. We're good. Or if I just had a little bit bigger house, not like extravagant, but just you know, like an extra couple hundred square feet, maybe a bedroom or a half bath. If I just had that, then, then I'd be happy. If I just had the, this really cute winter jacket I saw, if I just had that, then I would be happy, and I'd be warm this winter. Culture tells you if you buy blank, then you'll be happy. And this is a lie that has completely taken over the culture. It's completely taken over the world that we live in because we live in a culture that worships stuff. We live in a world that, that worships possessions, 
And if we begin to actually believe that stuff makes us happy, what happens is you'll end up living the rest of your life as a rat on a wheel, never actually being satisfied. And what's interesting is when you combat it with Scripture, you look at Scripture, Scripture actually talks about money more than it talks about heaven and hell combined. Scripture talks a whole lot about money. And a majority of the, the passages in the parables, a more majority of the passages in the Old Testament that talk about money, that talk about stuff, that talk about wealth, there's a lot of cautions that go with it. There's a lot of, uh, of caution signs that go with the passages about money. You think about the rich young ruler. You think about the man in Luke who Jesus is having a conversation with who goes and builds bigger barns. Jesus later calls him a fool. You look at the book of James, and as the, end of book of, as the end of the book of James comes, there's elitists who call Jerusalem home who are being called out because of their unwillingness to give to the poor because they're holding on to their wealth. You look at Scripture, there's a lot of caution signs in Scripture when it comes to dealing with stuff, dealing with money, dealing with luxury. Now I'm going to say this, I'm not against having stuff. I'm not against, it's okay to have nice stuff. It's just not okay for your stuff to have you. Uh, understand that. It's not a bad thing to have stuff. It's just not okay for your stuff to have you. And it can have you when you go into debt for it. Because at that point, when you go into debt to have your stuff, you're now in bondage. Your stuff owns you. And we live in a culture where our stuff continues to own us. Proverbs chapter 22 says this. It says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. So when you go into debt, when you buy things that you can't afford, there's a level of financial bondage that you've got in your life. And, and you live with this kind of bondage. When you live that way, you're unable to make decisions for yourself. You don't have options. You don't have choices. I've talked with people who who have this desire to do something more with their life. And yet they've got credit card debt, they've got car payments that keep them from living the life that they want to live. They haven't built enough margin into their life to make different choices because their stuff is owning them. And your stuff, it can own you when your identity, when your contentment, when your joy... When your peace, when all that you have is wrapped up, up in your stuff, your stuff owns you. Your stuff can own you at an emotional level. Your stuff can also own you at a heart level. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. When Jesus is talking in this passage about serving masters, he's talking about serving God and money, he says. He says, you can't serve God and serve money. It, it's not possible. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this, this thing that Jesus is saying? Because we live in a culture. We live in a culture that, that, that says, your stuff, it's your everything. Your stuff is what matters more than anything else in the world. It's all about your stuff. And when that becomes the foundation of how you live your life, being about your stuff, what happens is without you even recognizing it, there's this little root that begins to take place in your life, begins to plant seeds. It's the root of comparison. If I can just have this, if I can just go on that vacation like them, if I can just have this new car, if I can just have what they have, then, then I'm going to be happy. And Pastor Craig Rochelle, he said this once. He said, comparison will either make you feel inferior or superior. Neither honors God. Let me say that again. Comparison will make you feel either superior, meaning you are better than them because you have more than them, or inferior because you have less than them. And neither superiority or inferiority, neither of those thought processes honor God. Because if you think you can just have what they th have, it's going to make you better. If you think that, it, when you look at everyone else, and you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, can I give you just a news flash? The Joneses are broke. 
The Joneses don't have any money because studies show that 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 40% of Americans don't have enough cash to handle a $400 emergency. And so we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. We're trying to, to compare our life with people who can't even afford to live the life that they're living. And yet that was, that's what comparison does. You throw social media on top of it, it's like pouring gas on a fire. We scroll through social media and see all these things that people have, all these desires. We carry the Joneses around with us in our back pocket on our phones. They're right there as we scroll and look through and what they've got. And you can't can't compare your lifestyle with everyone else's, but yet we do it so regularly. That's just, just how it is. And I think it's crazy that we do that. I remember a while back I was scrolling through Instagram and I came across this mom's page, and this mom, she had four kids. And, and any time as a parent, I don't know if you're like me, but any time I come across another parent and they've got more kids than I do, like, I've got two kids, all right? They're, they're a handful in and of themselves. That's why we play man-to-man defense, man and woman to child defense. There's two of us and two of them. All right? I don't know how parents that do zone defense, I don't know how that works. And so I look at this, this mom who's got four kids, and I'm like, I don't know how you do it. It doesn't make sense. And so here she is, she's, she's planning this, this outing to the park with her kids, and she's got these four kids, and they go out to the park, and they've got their wicker basket for their picnic, they've got the monogrammed blanket, all the kids are matching in their perfect little outfits, and she pulls out these homemade snacks that are, that are non-GMO, gluten-free, grain-free homemade snacks, and, and as I'm scrolling through, I look over, and I've got Savannah over here in her PJs in the middle of the day with a string cheese hanging out of her mouth. And I've got Ezra on this side that's got what seems to be some semblance of what he thinks looks like an outfit with a handful of goldfish. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm a terrible dad. And yet that's how we react. I I don't know how they do it. You're scrolling through Facebook and you see that friend of yours posts the picture of the new kitchen that they just recently had updated. The cabinets look beautiful. It's got the gold pulls on it, beautiful backsplash, shiplap all over the kitchen. It looks like Joanna Gaines walked in and went bibbidi-bobbidi-boo and showed up this kitchen. And you're scrolling, you're like, man, you know what? I would really like a little bit more air in my kitchen. I could use a new kitchen too. Or you're scrolling through social media around Christmas time because we know that everybody around Christmas time posts all the gifts that they get. They post where they're going and what they got for Christmas. And so you see the girl standing in front of her new Mercedes. And you're like, huh, I could use a new car. Maybe not a Mercedes, but I I would do it with a new Honda. Like, that'd be good. And yet what happens is we forget that that mom with those four kids that looked picture perfect in their picnic at the park day, those four kids were running around screaming at each other before they took that perfect picture. We forget that in order to remodel their kitchen... The family took out a second mortgage and now the husband's lost his job and we don't see the stress and the freak out that they're dealing with right now. You don't see a woman posting on Facebook her 2000 Honda Civic with 300,000 miles say, look what my hubby got me, hashtag blessed. (laughs) And yet that's the world that we live in. And I know that you know that social media has been around long enough But it's a reminder of the trap, the comparison trap that we can all fall in. And so when you compare yourself, when you compare your life to the life that other people are living, it leaves you with a level of emptiness. Because the life that they're portraying, it's empty. It's make-believe. It's a fairy tale. Because they're just posting the highlight. They're just posting the best form of it. They're not posting the totality of their life, the screaming that the mom had to do to get her kids to take that perfect picture. And yet people will spend money. People will spend money that they don't have to keep up, to keep up the lifestyle that they think that everyone is living because it's a lifestyle that they're missing out on. So how do we break this? How do we break this, not just this comparison cycle, But how do we break this contentment? When the world says you have to buy blank, you have to have blank in order to be happy. How do we combat our stuff owning us? How do we combat comparison? 
The first way that you combat it is through gratitude. You combat it through gratitude. Christine Kane, she says this. She says, gratitude is not just what he has given you. It's what he has entrusted to us. Gratitude's not just what he's given you. It's what he's entrusted to us. And I love that because that's the truth, right? When you look at scripture, scripture calls us stewards. It, it, steward is a manager. That's what it means. We are managing stuff, God's stuff for him. Whether it's your job, whether it's your investments, whether it's your kids, whether it's your education, whether it's your time, we are just stewarding. We are managing what God has entrusted to us. And when that understanding goes from your head to your heart to your soul, it begins to change the way that you view things. It begins to change the way that you think about your stuff, about your money, about luxury. You suddenly go from, from these closed fists holding so tightly to what you think belongs to you when you shift your focus and you begin to understand and have gratitude that God has actually given to you, you begin to do this. You open your hands. You open your hands and you live a life open-handed because it doesn't belong to you in the first place. So if God tells you to give, then you give. If God tells you to enjoy it, you enjoy it like he wants you to enjoy it. But here's the thing. You can't know what God is asking you to do unless you have a relationship with him. That's why it's so important to spend time in the word on a regular basis. Because if you don't spend time with God, how are you going to know what God is calling you to do? How are you going to be able to discern what God is asking you to do with the things that he's entrusted to you in the first place? If you're not actually spending time with him. And so you've got to get to know him. You've got to spend time with him to learn how you can use the things that he's given us. And a heart filled with gratitude, there's no room for discontent. So we combat our stuff owning us. We combat comparison by having gratitude for what God's entrusted to us. The next way that we combat it is we move from gratitude to a, a place of humility. We move from gratitude to a place of humility. And Rick Warren, he says this, he says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's not humiliation. It's not putting yourself down. It's when you begin to realize that life isn't just about you. And we live in a culture that is all about me. 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 It's about me. We have cell phones that have cameras that face us so we can get great pictures of ourselves. Culture is all about me. But when you live with humility, you begin to look up. You begin to look out and you see others. And you see that God has actually called us to serve. He's called us to give to others. When you look at the scripture, you look at the Bible, you look at what God says in Genesis, it says that we were created in the image of God. God gave his son Jesus. God is the best giver. He gave his only son Jesus for you and for me. He sent him to the cross so that he could pay the penalty for our sins so we could have a personal relationship with a perfect and holy God. So scripture says that we were created in the image of God. We were created to be generous. We were created to not be about ourselves. That's who we are. It's in our DNA as Christ followers. So when we have gratitude of what God has entrusted to us, we can now begin to look up and see how we can bless and give and serve others. And then lastly, it's contentment. It's contentment. How do you keep from your stuff owning you? Is you, you have gratitude, you find humility, and you have contentment. Contentment, it's not apathy. It's not laziness. You can still have goals. You can still work hard. You can still have dreams. You can still strive. Contentment is the peace that the Holy Spirit brings to your heart and spirit and your soul. It's where you're able to say, you know what? I'm here for a reason. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 says this. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And we live in a culture that hasn't gained a lot. 
Because we live in a culture where people are chasing and running after the wrong stuff. But when you have godliness with contentment, man, it says there's great gain. What a beautiful thing. Godliness with contentment. So when culture says, if you just have this, then you're going to be happy. You can look at culture and say, no. Godliness with contentment. That's what's going to bring me peace. That's what's going to bring me joy. The second lie that culture tells us is that you are your mistake. The second lie culture says is you are your mistake. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Our true identity is in Christ. Amen. Not in our mistakes. We all fall short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. If you're over the age of five years old, whether you're watching online, listening at another time, you're here this morning. If you're over the age of five, can I tell you this? You've probably made a mistake with money at some point along the way. That's st statistically speaking, that's probably the reality of it. The hard thing is some of us have made some mistakes that have a couple additional zeros on the end of it. And that's challenging. But you're not your mistake. You're not your money mistakes. And money, though, is the only thing that has a scorecard for us in life. I could tell you that, that Audrey and I, our marriage is wonderful. I'm so blessed by my wife. I love her, and we've got a great thing going. But I can't, I can't put a score to it. I could tell you that, that my spiritual life has, has seemed a little dry recently, but I couldn't put a score to it. But money? There's a scorecard for your money. It's your net worth, right? What you own minus what you owe, that's your net worth. And the problem is, the culture that we live in, our world today says your net worth is your self-worth. Culture says your net worth is how you should feel about yourself. We've got to flip the script on that. That's not how it's supposed to be. Your net worth, what you have, should not define what you're worth. Mistakes, they're inevitable. But our, our errors are opportunities for us to grow. I remember uh, a few years back, Audrey was driving my car one day, and she was backing out of the garage, and Audrey's got a little bit of a lead foot. And as she stepped on the accelerator to back out of our garage, she's also a little impatient at times. The garage door didn't make it all the way up before my car collided with our garage door. And the car that we had had one of those little fins on the top of it. And, and just in case you're wondering, those fins aren't just for decoration. Okay? Those fins usually have some computer parts in there and they're for actually serving a purpose. And so that mistake that she made backing into our garage door, not being patient with our time or, or with, with her time waiting, it, it, it cost us a little bit of money. But it was a mistake. It, it wasn't like she was like, I'm going to see what I can do to cost us the most money today. It was a mistake. She did it on accident. Mistakes, they're inevitable. They happen. They're part of life. So when you make mistakes, don't let them identify you. You are not your mistakes, monetarily speaking. But also, don't enable yourself. Don't let others enable you. Just say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. You keep doing it. Not a big deal. <laughs> but don't let them be too legalistic about it where the rules define the relationship. Find the grace in the middle. The grace in the middle of it, knowing that, okay, there's grace. I know that I'm not my mistake. And then the third lie that culture teaches us, the third lie that culture says is they teach us this mindset of, of YOLO. Now, for those of you that are older, it's an acronym that means you only live once. And there's truth in it, right? I mean, we do only live once unless you believe in reincarnation, which we can have a different conversation another day about that. But we only get one life to live. But when that's your mindset, when your mindset is, is instant gratification, I want to do what feels good in the moment, you're living a lie. Proverbs chapter 13 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. When you're a good man, when you're a wise man, you're thinking about the generations beyond you. You're thinking beyond the moment. Because the generations beyond you are going to know how you handled this. Your kids are watching you. 
your grandkids, they're watching you. So what are you passing down to them? And I'm not talking about purely just a, a monetary, are you passing money to them? I'm talking beyond that. And I pray that if you're in a position to do that, what a wonderful thing. What a blessing that you're leaving for your family. But I'm talking about something beyond that. Because how you handle your relationship with money, it's going to outlast you. How you handle your relationship with money, it's going to outlast you. Does your relationship with money, does it own you? Does your stuff own you? Do you serve God or do you serve money? These are the questions that, that people are asking. And your legacy is, is going to be a big part of this. Where our culture doesn't think about the long term. Our culture, we live in a culture that thinks about instant gratification. They live in the short term. They think momentarily. But how you handle your money, it's going to outlast you. And not just the tangible finances that are dollars, but, but how you handle it. It's going to outlast you. I remember growing up in high school when I started driving, um, I wasn't just given the keys to the car and say, go and have a good time, and you don't have to pay for anything. I, I had to pay for my insurance in my car as a high schooler. I had to pay for the gas in my car as a high schooler. And I remember, you know, when I was growing up, having these conversations, like, how am I supposed to have a job, Mom? I, I play three sports that are six days a week. How, how am I supposed to have a job? And then I volunteer at church. Like, I don't have an open day. How is this supposed to work? I want to go hang out. I want to go do stuff. I don't got money. How is this going to work? My mom had a bookkeeping business, and she said, well, I'll hire you, and I'll pay you to do bookkeeping work to pay for your gas, to pay for your insurance. And so I worked in high school doing bookkeeping work for my mom because she was passing on a legacy to me. She was passing on a legacy to my brother. And now that legacy is going beyond my brother and myself. That legacy is now transcending to our children because our children at five and seven years old are understanding that you can't just have whatever you want. Money doesn't grow on trees, surprisingly. But you just whip the card out and there we get to take it home. No, it doesn't work that way, Ezra Savannah. You actually have to work for stuff. So my kids have stuff they have to do around the house to earn a commission at our house. They don't just get free handouts. Now, yes, we want to bless them. Of course we bless them. We're their parents. I love to do that. But I also want them to understand you got to put a little bit of hard work in. Amen. There's a legacy that my mom was leaving for not just my brother and I, but for our children. My brother's doing the same thing with his kids. I remember when, when Audrey and I, when I was proposing, getting ready to propose to Audrey, I wanted to ask her dad's permission to propose to her. And, and so it was the second time that I had met her dad and we sat down and had a nice old three-hour conversation. <laughs> Mom kept coming in, checking, are you guys doing okay? And it was a three-hour conversation. And as we walked through this conversation, the reason it took so long is he had a contract that I had to sign. <laughs> now, before you go too far down the road, he's not legalistic or anything like that. There, it, it's actually an incredible thing and I'm very grateful that he did that and, and it's something that I'll do with Savannah. But he looked at me as we were having this conversation, and, and he looks at me and says, says, Josh, I've invested 19 years into this young woman. I'm not about to let you go and screw it up. <laughs> now, that might sound harsh, but, but there's a purpose. His daughter, he invested into it. It was intentional. And so we walked scripturally through what being a husband meant, what it looked like, and we had all these things that we walked through, and, I, and I'm grateful for it. It sounds terrible. I was afraid, by the way, at 22 when I was doing this, but, but now I look back, and I'm like, that was wonderful, and, and one of the things that was in that contract is he said, Josh, I've, I've made decisions in life financially that haven't been to my benefit. He said, I've made mistakes. He talked with me through some of them, and he said, I, I want to help you not make the same mistakes, and so one of the things that, that I'm asking you to do as you enter into marriage with Audrey, is I want you to take a financial class within your first year of getting married. I want to protect you. I want to help you not have the mistakes that I had as a married person. Now, he, he wasn't going to say and nullify the marriage because all this stuff didn't happen, right? But he was saying, I believe in this. I don't want you to have the same things happen to me or happen to you that happened to me. He invested in our understanding of, of finances, in our understanding of it's not just about stuff. And I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the legacy that my mom left. I'm grateful for the legacy that my father on left. My father on left. See, you see, your legacy is not just what you leave behind, but how you impact those who follow in your footsteps. 
Your legacy is not just what you leave, whether it be monetary or beyond. It's how you impact the people that are following you. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I know that. To have parents who have chosen to follow what Scripture says about finances instead of what culture says about finances. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I can look to my parents. I can look to family members that have chosen to honor the principles of God instead of being consumed by what the culture says. Now, they're not perfect, and neither am I when it comes to this. I want you to understand that, all right? I've made plenty of my own monetary mistakes as well. But, but when it comes to this subject of looking through the lens with our decisions, I pray that, that we can find godliness with contentment. Yeah. Godliness with contentment, that leads to great gain, Scripture says. It leads to a legacy of life. And I'm so thankful for the legacy that's been passed on to me. I'll close with this. Deuteronomy chapter 30 says this. I've called heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. So choose life that you and your descendants may live. We don't have to live the way culture tells us to live. Don't be surprised if you do and you get culture's results. Don't be surprised if you're living in bondage, if you're feeling the pain of the financial decisions of your past, but understand you are not the mistakes of your past. Invest now in making adjustments to being able to live the life you desire to live. But sometimes that might mean that we have to make some sacrifices to get to where we want to get to. And we can begin to understand that it's not about the stuff that we have. We can begin to understand it's not about me. We are just simply called to be managers of what God has given to us. Remember, when you came into the world, there was nothing attached to you. And when you leave the world, you're not taking anything with you. Everything that you have in this world has been given to you by God to steward, to manage. Quit holding on with tight fists. Open your hands. Say, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to follow you in this area? as the weight that you're carrying, the bondage that you find yourself in from your stuff owning you. Watch as the weight begins to evaporate. When you begin to live as scripture calls us to live. Would you pray with me today? God, we thank you that you love us so much to be the incredible example of what giving looks like. God, you sacrificially surrendered, sacrificed, gave up your son Jesus to go to the cross to pay for our debt, to pay for our sins so we could have a relationship with you. God, we're grateful for that. And God, I pray that this topic of our stuff ruling over us, of us believing the lies that culture tells us, of us comparing our lives to the ones that we see around, God, I pray that you would give us a way God, I pray that you would help us to be in your word, to know your scripture, to know the truth about how to handle these things. How to handle this topic of life being hard. Of money. It can be so consuming and so damaging. But God, you've given us life. To be a new creation. you're here today and you walked away from that relationship you once had with Jesus. Maybe you've never began a personal relationship with Jesus. And today's the day that you're ready to receive the freedom that he offers. You've been living life in bondage and a relationship with Jesus offers freedom. It doesn't mean life's going to be perfect and easy. It just means that the pain will begin to subside. If you're here today, 
ready to receive that love of Jesus, that unconditional love, regardless of your past mistakes, regardless of where you've been, what you've done. Heads bowed and eyes closed if that's you today. Ready to say yes to a relationship with Jesus. On the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. And what we'll do is we'll repeat a prayer together. Everybody in the room will repeat it line by line. We don't want to single you out. We don't want to embarrass you. That's why everybody's going to do it with you. But if that's you today, you're ready to receive that unconditional love of God. On the count of three, would you just lift your hand? Say, Jesus, I'm ready to receive your love. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I see you. Would you all pray this prayer with me? Say, dear Jesus, thank you for coming to this world on my behalf. For going to the cross, giving up your life so that I could have life. Today, Jesus, I place my faith in you. I surrender control to you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a new creation. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we join in with the party in heaven? Yeah. Thank you.